Uh, This is a reading from uh, Matthew chapter 5, the the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of our Lord. Good morning again. Uh, As always, encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to keep them open to where uh, Alex just read. It's Matthew chapter 5, and uh, we're going to look at some of the verses that come before and after that. Um, uh, Matthew 5 to 7 is something known as uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus likely preached it multiple times. Uh, Different gospel writers record um, uh, parts of it. And it was probably something that he taught over and over so that it was well known enough, as, as, as it was in those days, well known enough verbally that they passed it down to when it actually the scripture was written. Uh, these guys could, could write the major teachings of Jesus with, with super integrity here. Um, I don't know where you're from or what weird sayings you have from growing up. And you may recognize this, uh, but in South Georgia, one of the, the phrases that I would hear my parents say a lot of times was uh, same difference. Have you ever used that term? We'd be talking about something and somebody would say, well, same difference. Um, I never thought about how odd that, that phrase is, um, same difference. Um, but when somebody says same difference, what are they saying? They're saying, hey, these are similar enough that you might as well be talking about the same thing. Some would say, Coke and Pepsi, same difference. Others would say, absolutely not. <laughs> Some would say, uh, someone might be talking about, you know, uh, well, this team, uh, you know, playing baseball last year lost 100 games. And somebody else say, well, no, they lost 96. And then that person will say, well, same difference. What are they saying? They were awful. Either way, whether it's 100 or 96, it's, it's, they were, what I'm trying to communicate is they were bad, right? Same difference. A lot of people, when they come to Christianity and they compare what the Bible teaches or what they think Christians believe or maybe how Christians live and their understanding of what it means to be a Christian, they look at Christianity and they look at how they live their lives or compared to other world religions, and they say basically same difference. And when they say same difference, what they're saying is either, on the one hand, you know, when I look at the lives of the people that go to church, and I look at basically how I live my life, it's not that much different. I mean, they're, I basically live by some of the same teachings. Or they're saying, you know, what I believe and what I was grown up and the religion I was taught, and when I compare it to some of the major teachings of Christianity, It's basically the same thing. Our tendency could be to do that with the Sermon on the Mount. Because what we do is we come to the Sermon on the Mount and we see moral teachings. We see things that that Jesus is addressing. And if we're not careful, we can read through it quickly. And we can walk away saying, basically, same difference. Basically, Jesus is hitting the same major teachings that make society run and function in a normal way where people don't kill each other. You may say, okay, Jesus, I get that we're not supposed to murder. And you're taking it a little bit further and saying, okay, and don't be mean people either. Don't be angry people, right? Or, okay, we get that, that divorce may be not healthy for society. And we're telling you, we, we see you're saying, actually, think a little bit further than that. So, so you're, you're taking moral teaching and maybe you're just, you know, kind of upping it a little bit. But we would miss the point of the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount if that's what we thought. If we read through it and we walked away saying same difference. What we're going to see in the passage before us today is the key to unlocking the rest of the sermon. It's the key that Jesus uh, he, he gives these few verses to say, hey, as you read through the rest of what's to come. And as you process what's just come, don't 
miss this key because it's going to tell you that it's not about these externals. It's not just the same difference. What I'm teaching is radically different because it affects the heart. If we were to go back and look at what just comes just before, we would see Jesus has been called into, into ministry. He has been set apart by John the Baptist in his baptism. He has been tempted by the evil one. Uh, and now he's begun his ministry. He's called his first disciples. And if you go back and read the calling of the first disciples, he goes to these fishermen, these kind of tough guys uh, that, you know, uh, that have been used to working with their hands and doing manual labor. And one by one, he, he says to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Which, you know, it, it, at least that means, hey, I'm going to teach you how to catch, you know, uh, something more substantial, something more meaningful, do something more uh, substantial with your lives as, as it pertains to the kingdom. But uh, some commentators believe w because that phrase fishers of men is used in, and it's used in the Old Testament in terms of judgment, what they would do is if a conquering king were to conquer a group of people, they would literally string them together with fish hooks in their mouth in a, a line and parade them in before their, their people to say this is what happens to enemies of us. We capture them and we catch them and we make them our own. So some people believe when Jesus said this, it was actually revolutionary. It had revolutionary tones to it. In other words, it, it, it was saying, hey, you want a revolution? I'm going to come follow me and I, we're going we're gonna to revolt. We're about to cause a revolution here. It had tones of it of you're rough and ready men that would make good warriors. Drop your, drop your nets and pick up your club and come follow me. And we're about to go take down Rome. Which is what Jesus was accused of at times as other revolutionaries. But what he does is he takes these guys that are ready to see change, ready to see something major happen. Not to, to just keep the status quo. And then he says, now let me tell you what that kingdom is going to look like. Let me tell you what this revolution is going to actually entail. It's not bringing the physical, setting up a new physical kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. It has more to do, though, than just these externals. It's going to see heart change. Um, so when Jesus comes here, we need to realize he's just got through do, calling those kind of men to come follow him and to learn his way of revolution. And he's also just healed all sorts of sicknesses, cast out demons, done these unbelievable demonstrations of power. And now he sits down with the disciples, the 12, and people listening in from the mountaintop, from the hillside, and speaking so that they can listen in. And he's saying, let me tell you what kingdom life looks like. It's not just more of the same. I'm not just regurgitating what you already know is true and calling you to a little bit bigger version of it. I'm going to tell you something that's going to change everything. It's not just the same difference. So what is he saying? For two things here in this passage specifically. He's gonna say, we're going to see Jesus in the law and the Christian in the law. He's going to talk about our relationship to the law and how what he's putting forward is different. First, we see Jesus in the law in verses 17 and 18. Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota or a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus is saying, hey, this is, this is my relationship with the Old Testament scriptures. This is my relationship with all that's come before. The law and the prophets is one way of talking about the whole Old Testament. He, he could be accused because of his authority and how he came to teach and, and how he had already begun his ministry. He could be easily accused to say, are you setting this aside? Are you doing, teaching something new? Are you just embellishing it? What, what, what are you doing here? And Jesus is like, no, I'm not, I'm not abolishing it. But I'm, but I'm not just leaving it as it is either. I'm coming to fulfill it. What is he saying? Well, at least these three things about his relationship with the law. First, we know from the Old Testament scriptures there were three types of law. And Jesus is coming to say, I fulfilled them all. So the first, first thing he's saying is the three types of law in the Old Testament were, were civil, ceremonial, and moral. I promise this is helpful. <laughs> if you study the scriptures, it's helpful to know the types of laws that you read and all that thick Old Testament stuff that you're like, and do this and this and this and this. Why is all this stuff in there? Because those laws were given to govern a civil kingdom where God was their king and these were the people and this is how life should be done in this society that God was setting up with the people of Israel in the Old Testament. 
He's saying this is how you, you interact with your neighbor. This is how government should, should function. This is how these things uh, go on. Jesus is saying, hey, that was for a redemptive part of history with those people. And yet I've come, and in what I'm going to accomplish with my life and death and resurrection is going to fulfill all that. So, so that God's kingdom can come and fill all of the earth, not just a group of people at a certain time. That doesn't mean that our national governments are, are supposed to be a, an, an expression of that. It means the church is that. And that one day all of the earth will be filled in ways that the people treat. And yet there are principles we can draw from those Old Testament civil laws that are just uh, uh, integral to how we interact with one another. And Jesus is saying, everything I do is going to fulfill that. Secondly, ceremonial. You read all the ceremonial laws of Leviticus. What is all that stuff for? So that the people of God could deal with the sin in their own hearts and in their midst so that they could come into a relationship with God. So that they could approach him. All of that blood spilt, all of that stuff that happened was so that they could atone for their sin and come into the presence of God. Jesus is saying, with my coming, I am the Lamb of God. I'm fulfilling it all. The whole system that was set up, what I'm about to do with my life, death, and resurrection is going to complete it. No more shedding of blood. Because I'm going to fulfill that. So those two things are, are part of the Old Testament. When we read those, we realize, okay, that was for a time and a set. But then there's something deeper under that that we call the moral law. So when Jesus gave, I mean, when, when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, it wasn't like it's the first time everybody, somebody thought, oh, I maybe shouldn't kill other people. It says do not murder. No, what he was doing was he was going back to creational norms and he was saying, hey, this is how things are supposed to work. These are the, the, the linchpins of, of what society is built on, the moral law. And what, it was creational, so it doesn't ever stop. It's always going to be this way. And Jesus is saying, watch how I live. Watch what I give my life for. Watch what I, I resurrect to, to bring to completion. It's, it, it, I'm going to uphold the moral law. All aspects of the law, Jesus say, is going to be fulfilled in me. So the types of the law, Jesus fulfills. But secondly, the uses of the law. The laws are useful, right? The reason we put them on their books. Now, uh, one of my, my kids has told me they're studying all those laws that are on the books that are just ridiculous over the years. You've seen laws that, that make it to the books and then just stay there that have no, you're like, did somebody really do that so that somebody wrote a law against it and it's still on the books all these years later, right? But there's actually, y'all, laws are meant to be useful. They're written for a purpose. What are the uses of the law of God? Well, first of all, to restrain evil. Uh, you put laws in place to keep things from getting as bad as they could get without the law. They restrain evil. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to live that way. I'm going to be a fulfillment of what it looks like to push back evil and to live as we're intended to live. Secondly, laws, the law of God, points to our need for a Savior. That's the second thing the law does for us. As we try to keep it, we realize how far short we fall and how we need a Savior. We need somebody that can do this, that can fulfill it for us. So it points us to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to come do it. In every point of the law that you fail to keep, I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep it. And then thirdly, the law is a guide to our path. It's the lamp that we walk the dark road with that shows us how life works best. And Jesus is going to say, by my life and my death and resurrection, I'm going to show the way. I'm going to fulfill this. So bear with me. But Jesus fulfills all the types of the law. He fulfills all the uses of the law and the prophets. And the prophets were all about the promises of God looking forward. They said one would come, a Messiah, that could do this, that could bring the kind of restoration that Israel so desperately needed. Jesus is saying... And him saying, I fulfill it, he's saying, I'm him. I'm him. I'm the one that you've been waiting for and looking for. But even deep, more deeply, what was, the, what was the Messiah supposed to do? Well, if we go back and read Jeremiah 31 or Ezekiel 36, he's saying, hey, all of these laws dealt with externals. They dealt with external obedience to restrain evil and to show you your need for a savior and a king. And yet... There is a heart behind it all that hasn't been addressed. You can keep all of these external things, 
and your heart stay the same. And you never, never violate one of those, but you, you never violate them because your fear of getting caught or because you want to be prideful and say you've kept them all. But there's not a heart change that's behind that. And Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 talked about a time coming when people would obey God from the heart, the changed hearts. And Jesus is saying, that's what I'm pointing to here. That's the fulfillment, the kind of fulfillment that I came to, br- to bring, to usher in. So when he says in this passage that not an iota or a dot will pass away, that's what he's saying. The fullness of all that the Old Testament pointed to, I'm coming to complete. What is an iota? What is a dot? What is it talking about? Another saying from growing up. I remember my, my grandma and my mom saying, well, that, that, that you know, they basically, I can't even remember how they exactly used it, but not, not one iota. That didn't make a lick of sense, not one iota. I was like, what in the world is that? I, and it just, as a kid, I was like, okay, that's the saying we say. And then I get in Hebrew class years later, and I'm like, oh, that's a piece, a part of the Hebrew letters. The, 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 the little swishes and dots of the Hebrew language that give meaning to the consonants, that add vowels and add meaning and set apart different parts of Scripture are iotas and dots. And he's saying, hey, if you leave one of these out, or if you add an extra one, it changes the whole thing. Every little piece of that language is important. He's saying, hey, not one thing that was promised in the Old Testament law and prophets am I going to leave untouched. I'm going to fulfill it all in my life, death, and resurrection. In other words, it's all about Jesus. Everything written out in God's word is all about Jesus. Scotty said it last week when we looked at this idea, this call of being salt and light. What is salt and light? Well, salt, he said, brings out flavor. Light illuminates. And he's, he basically pointed us to say what, what Jesus was saying is like, you are salt, but what you do is you bring out and, and you highlight me to everyone. And you're, you're, you're light, but you're light like a, a luminary, like one of those bags that holds the candle. You hold the light of Jesus, so you illuminate, you make shine him forth. So what he's saying is the point is Jesus. It's all about him. Every part of God's word. My professors in seminary used to teach me that every p- passage of scripture you come to has what they would call a fallen condition focus. It's a way of saying it addresses one area of our lives that are broken, that are fallen, that need Jesus. And because they ha- all have a fallen condition focus, we can always, they always point to a redemptive provision that Jesus provides. So any part of scripture that you read shows you a, a broken part of your own heart or your life that Jesus fulfills. It's all about Jesus. That's the first thing. Secondly, what he says here is now what do you do about it? How does that affect you as a Christian, as one who follows Jesus? And that's verse 19 and 20. Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He's giving us an interpretive matrix to make sense of everything that's going to come afterwards. After this passage, he's going to go into a series of passages where he talks about, you've heard it said, but I say to you. I want us to, as we read that and as we study that going forward, I want us to hear it with where we started with today. I want us to hear it with a a man who was passionate. We think of Jesus as gentle and lowly, and he was. But when I picture him on the sermon, uh, uh, preaching the Sermon on the Mount, I don't picture him with a soft voice saying these things. I, I, I take him like a, a coach would, a player who continues to do something in the game that is causing his team to lose and is causing him to, to not flourish as a player. Saying, hey, I know you're used to doing it this way, but if you'll just do it this way, there's something different. There's a different way of thinking here. There's a different way of doing here. I think Jesus is pleading with the people of his age saying, don't fall in to just thinking this is the way that it's done. Just because you've heard it taught this way. I'm telling you, there's something deeper at stake here. There's a better way. There's a deeper way. That's the way he's, I, I, I picture him preaching because he ends this series in chapter 7 saying, 
there's two ways you can go on. One leads to destruction, one leads to life. There's two types of trees you can be. One bears fruit, one is useless. There's, there's two houses you can build. One is, is on a firm foundation and one will be swept away. In other words, there's two ways of thinking about things. One that you've heard it said and one that I say to you. If you follow that, you've heard it said, it's going to be poison and it's going to end in destruction. If you follow the I say to you, it will lead to life and godliness. So there's, there's, there's energy here. There's a twist here. You've heard it said, but I say to you. And what the focus is, is that the you've heard it said focuses on the external. And the I say to you focuses on the heart. The you've heard it said is going to focus on the outward form. But the I say to you is going to focus on the heart reality. It's the difference between religion and relationship. Outward form and personal knowledge. That's why he says... Your righteousness has got to exceed the scribes and the Pharisees. That would have been huge for them. The scribes were the clearest interpreter, the best interpreters of God's law. The Pharisees were the best practitioners. You know, these guys and, and girls had um, over 600 laws that they deduced from the law of God, prohibitions and actions that they were to take. So, for instance, for the Sabbath, there was only so many words you could say, so many steps you could take, so many, um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it was so, so many gulps you could take. I mean, it was like very, very intricate for how, how much work you could do and still keep the Sabbath. What were they doing? They were taking God's law on the Sabbath, adding all this stuff that then they could then measure and keep so that they could fulfill the law, at least externally. But it didn't change their heart. They still missed out on the fact that there were sick people that needed to be healed in their midst. Or whatever else it was. And Jesus kept confronting that, right? Over and over. He's telling them, hey, I'm giving you an interpre interpretive matrix to come with everything that comes afterwards. That there's this outward form, but there's a heart a reality um, at, at play there. And so that matter of the heart is, is crucial here. Hebrews 11 speaks to it where it talks about faith and it says faith is believing that God exists and that he rewards those who seek him I love that expression of it because it summarizes what it means to have God's law be a matter of the heart you have to believe that he exists meaning that you have to trust his work his righteousness he's the one that's done all this stuff and that he rewards you you trust it, not just his work, but his person. That these, his inheritance that has been won for me is, is applied to me and to my life. It's heart application. It's obeying not just out of fear or pride, but because he loves me. In other words, it's knowing enough of God's love for me that it gives me a sense of value and hope and joy and reputation and significance that my salvation comes from him. So I don't do any of these things that he's going to teach on in order to gain his love, but because I already have it. I don't do all these things and then the Father will love me. No, I know the Father loves me. So now let me live out that in this area and that area. He's given us an interpretive matrix. He's saying, hey, know me. As the one who fulfills the law. All of its types, all of its uses, all of its promises. Know me that that's how much I've done. That's what I've done because I love you. And out of knowing that love, let it affect your heart. And then if it does affect your heart, look at the types of things that are going to usher forth from that. The type of lifestyle, the type of interaction with relationships that will come from a changed heart. I used to think, and I think, I mean, one of the biggest things in restudying this has done for me, I used to think that when you come to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was looking at the mean, bad people and the good people, and he was saying, don't be like those bad people. Be like these good people. Do this kind of stuff. But when you look at it, and you, 
you start to unpack it, I think what he's saying is, hey, don't be like these good people. Be like these people that have been changed from the heart. These people are doing a lot of right stuff that looks good on the outside that you wouldn't mind sending your kids over to play at their house because they're not going to be watching R-rated movies and talking dirty and all the things. But you can live in such a way that feels like kind of same difference. You can get this from a lot of different places and a lot of different areas. And I'm telling you something different here. Perk up your ears and listen. Because that kind of a life, you can live in it, and it never actually come into relationship with me and know me personally and have your heart changed. And what I'm telling you about is how to know me and what a life of knowing me then ushers forth. Do you see the difference? There's a commercial on sports radio in uh, Nashville, and it's got a guy with a great southern accent, accent Tennessee accent. And it's got birds chirping in the background, and he starts telling about for the beauty of Tennessee, you know, for game day, for this, for that. And his summary is, for the love of Tennessee, arrive safely. And you're like, that's an interesting way to encourage a public uh, radio announcement to be careful as you drive and arrive safely. He's, the motivation there is not... Hey, don't drive crazy. And all. he's saying just like, listen, there's a lot of things to enjoy and to love about life. So s slow down, calm down, and arrive safely <laughs> was basically the, the message of the, of the, of the commercial. But what, what they're trying to do is they're saying, hey, love is a motivator. It's a huge motivation. And you see it in people that love music. You love watching them play their instrument. Why? Because it's not just the, the scales and the duty. It's, man, you can tell they love that, and it comes through in their music. Or people that play sports. There's some people that play out of fear and to perform and for pride, and there's some people that just love the game. And it didn't matter how much money you paid them. They'd want to play, play it. Uh, Jesus is saying, if we were to come to him and ask him, Jesus, why did you come? Why did you come here? You know, the first words out of his mouth wouldn't be um, so that you can obey my laws. His first word would be, I came for you. I came to capture your heart. And when I capture your heart, this is the kind of life that's going to usher forth. And so if he were to ask us, if he were to flip the question on us and say, no, you just asked me why I came, let me, let me ask you. Christian, why are you trying to obey in that area? Why are you trying to follow this teaching of the Bible? What would we say? Would we say, well, that's the rule, and that's the right thing to do? Or would we say, because of you, because you have captured my heart? One of those is a, is a poison. One of those is the way of the kingdom. If we're coming to worship to devotional, to moral application of any of the teachings of, of, of God for any other reason than because I'm in love with Jesus, because he's captured my heart, then what Jesus is going to tell us is you've missed it. You've missed it. Let's pray that as we go throughout this sermon that we will fall more in love with him. God, we, we need you to do that in us. We don't want to be said of us as we look at other moral teachings in our world or other people that are just living life into their own um, set of, of norms. We don't want people to be able to say the same difference because we want to, to know you from our hearts. We want to have our hearts changed. We want not just behavior modification, but we want to fall in love with you. So would you capture our hearts, even especially as we go through this Sermon on the Mount? Would you point us to the deeper relational element of each one of these teachings and show yourself as, as beautiful as you are 
And as you change our hearts, as we fall more in love with you, we pray that you would change our lives, that we would see real application and change in all of these different areas, and that it would overflow and spill into those that we care about, that we would love to come to know you and to be changed by you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We respond to the teaching of God's word through the giving of our tithes and our offerings um, and of our hearts in worship and singing. So um, let's, let's prepare our hearts to do that using these words on the screen. Generous God, because you've so freely given to us, we now freely give the offerings of our hearts to you.